have a new face to many of, uh, many of you here. He is in the Designing Toronto Slack group, uh, does not shy away from stepping in conversations, uh, helping out folks of, across all levels of experience. Uh, he spoke at our December uh, event, at the holiday event that was held at RBC. And uh, that was his talk, was one of the most loved talks uh, of any designing speaker so far. Like the amount of amazing feedback we got. Uh, so we were super tempted and also super thrilled to have him back here. Um, he was heading design for the Ministry of Justice in UK, uh, has worked at Fortune 500 companies like Expedia, and then uh, Chris returned to Canada just about last year, I think, uh, to become the first chief of design at the Canadian Digital Services. So let's welcome Chris uh, Gobius with a, with a big round of applause. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> That's yours. All right. Can everyone hear me? Uh, there we go. Now I'm on. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. How was lunch? Yeah, OK, great. Uh, one of my favorite things about being on directly after lunch is we all have a nice full belly. We get into a nice warm room, settle down, get cozy. And just like university, you're tempted to fall asleep again. But I'm going to try and keep you engaged and entertained today. So Preet's already done a little bit of work for me. I'm going to see if I can get the clicker happening. There we go. So look, I'm here to talk to you today about sketches to strategy. And this is one of those funny things where about two weeks ago, Preet had said, look, what's uh, the name of your talk? And I was like, genuinely, I've never talked about leadership before, so I'm kind of figuring this out. Let's, let's go with this. And then as I was actually writing my talk and forming it up, and it wasn't last night, just so you know, uh, yeah, I came up with this subtitle, which was how I learned to stop worrying and embrace being a leader, which for the film nerds of you, you'll recognize that it's a Stanley Kubrick reference, and that's actually the second time I've done that in a talk. But uh, moving on from that, this is really about my path from being a design practitioner to being a design leader now, and understanding how my notions of leadership, success, and actually the day-to-day -day work have changed as a result. It's not been an easy thing, I've had a lot of challenges and obstacles. I'm still learning as I go, and I feel delighted and honored and flattered to be here today because, I mean, we all saw the talks this morning. They were exceptional. Uh, it's great to have to follow Jared Spool. You're like, ah, oh, great. That's going to be easy. Um, but regardless, I'm excited, and I hope I can share something that you'll enjoy today. So I have been leading design teams for nine years. And OK, wait, hold on a second. We should probably address the elephant in the room. Because some of you are doing the math already and thinking, wait, that doesn't make sense. And I'm about to tell you that it's nine years out of my 20-year career so far. And now you're really confused. So I'm just going to direct you to my Twitter bio right there, particularly this line. <laughs> because, <laughs> because this is not my first rodeo, people. Last year, last year, an MC introduced me. And just at the end of this great introduction, a lot like Preet's fantastic introduction, this MC just thought he'd throw in a great joke. He said, and he's only 18. And I was like, ha, 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 everyone gets the joke. This is going to be great. No, the rest of the conference was super awkward for me. I had a lot of people being like, so what school did you go to? What did your parents do? Were you an early immersion child? What's going on? I was just like, oh, no, 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 I am old. I am lucky. I got some good genetics and like a very, very healthy skincare regime. <laughs> OK. So that's, that's not the point. Let's get back to it. Uh, I've been so lucky to be able to lead design teams of all sizes, small, medium, large. And I've done that in startups, uh, Fortune 500 companies, and actually massive organizations, including two governments now. I spent, as Preet said, 10 years living in London, England, and I did a tremendous amount of work here, which is Silicon Valley or the, pardon me, the European equivalent of Silicon Valley, Silicon Roundabout. Uh, it's a traffic circle in East London. The British like to call them roundabouts. And then there's such a dense cluster of tech companies there. It's like, oh, Silicon Roundabout, that's a good name, even though it's terrible. Um, working there, I learned so much about being a designer, putting technology into play. And after leading design for a couple of startups, seeing them move into the next stage of their evolution, I actually went and worked at the Expedia Group. I was the lead designer or design lead uh, with Expedia for a while. And that was tremendous because it was about learning to design at scale. 
Expedia is massive. We're talking 10,000 full-time employees worldwide. I had teams in Springfield, Seattle, London, Berlin, and then scattered throughout Asia. And trying to coordinate that was a massive challenge for me as a design leader. Especially if you've ever been to Missouri, you'll know that uh, there's a cultural difference between the Missourians and, of course, Londoners. So I'm not making any judgments. It's just like one of those things that you have to realize, like, oh, this is going to be different. Okay. After working at Expedia for a while, I moved to the Ministry of Justice. And Jared, this morning, spoke a lot around the work that he and Dana Chisnell did in the United States Digital Service. The Ministry of Justice was the United Kingdom's efforts to transform government with human-centered design. And I was so lucky and so delighted to be there leading a team as their head. I left the Ministry of Justice, and I decided I was going to pack it up, come back to Canada. I took a little bit of time off, and then I lucked into an incredible role as the Chief of Design at the Canadian Digital Service, or for our francophone friends, la Service Numérique Canadienne. The important thing there is that, like government digital services around the world, Canada has decided it's time. It's time for us to apply human-centered design to the solution and try and solve some of these government service delivery problems. And we have a really straightforward mandate. It's to deliver simple and easy to use services for all Canadians. And even some people who aren't Canadians, people who are becoming Canadians, or people who are wanting to visit Canada for the first time. We want to solve those problems for them too. And the reason I'm taking you through my employment history and my CV is not because I want to talk about that, though I'm sure there's a bit of an imposter syndrome coming to play there, but more about the fact that as I've moved through these roles, as I've changed as a leader, as I've grown, as I've moved up in hierarchy and seniority, my notions of leadership and success have continually changed with me. I've had to reevaluate what it means to do work as a designer, and I'm gonna to get to that in a bit. All right, so let's start at the beginning. This is, of course, the beginning. We are all yellow dots at the beginning. No, I'm abstracting and I'm gonna make a point. I'm here to talk right now about the practitioner. The designer who starts out at the beginning of their career, uh, to bore from Jared's language, again, I'd planned this, but he's done this great work for me. This is the person who is consciously competent. As a designer starting out, their job is to learn the craft. They wanna make sure that they are understanding how to run a usability test, trying out layouts, observing testing, speaking to users. This is really, really about being in the center of the work as we know it, the design work as we know it. The reality is, if you look at that designer, they're sort of there. We've got leadership level on the left-hand side and craft across the bottom, distance from craft. And I had this realization as I began to move up and take on some leadership roles that as you take on leadership roles, as you evolve as a leader and a designer, you eventually begin to distance yourself from that craft, that day-to-day -day craft. And please bear with me because this isn't scientific and I've plotted it, and this is not based on much data, just a sample size of one. But I think it looks a little bit like this. This has been my experience, that as I've evolved as a leader, as I've grown, as my management duties, my leadership duties have increased, I've found myself further and further away from the day-to-day -day craft of being a designer. So I'd like to talk about when I moved into my first role as a head of design with a startup. This is a really well-recognized title. Uh, I think it's probably one of the most common titles going today. The head of design often reports to the chief product officer or maybe the chief technology officer, maybe a director of client experience, something like that. I think we're all familiar with this title. For me, transitioning into this head of design role meant really thinking about what my job and my work was because I found myself at the top of a structure that looked a bit like this. You might have a couple of team leads and there's designers and suddenly for me, I realized that the head of design role was more about looking internally and taking a moment to think about that team. It was about really, really focusing on these people. And Kim said it earlier brilliantly, De design ops is about trying to ask, you know, what are you doing? How could it be better? And what's the thing that's slowing you down? I really took that to heart. And I'd like to tell you a quick personal story because I think it informs my approach to being a head of design. Years and years and years ago, so really cast your mind back, please. Old. Um, I was struggling with a design problem, and I'd been working and working, and it was one of those things where I was just getting very frustrated, and I knew enough that 
I had to stop and I had to ask for help. Seems like a good thing. And I took it to my head of design at the time, and I will never forget this. It's a formative moment for me. They looked at the work I was doing, and they turned to me, and with just a bit of disgust and just a little frustration, well, a lot of frustration, they said, Chris, you have to try to at least solve it. And I was gutted, like just cut to the core, humiliated, ears burning, embarrassed. Because I felt like I was consciously competent, but I'd been struggling. And this person who, in fairness, was probably having a terrible day, had probably been knocked around by a couple of clients and then like been told, you know, do it faster, cheaper, and better all at once, please. But that was a formative moment for me because I said to myself, if I ever get the opportunity to lead a team, if I ever get the opportunity to work with designers, I'm gonna try my damnedest to bring patience and really focus on them. Because I hadn't heard from this head of design in ages, and when I finally got time with them, that was their reaction. And I said, you know what, I've gotta be present. I have to be with that team more often. And that led to one of the first things that I realized about transitioning away from that day-to-day -day craft into the actual new work of being a head of design, which was that I was gonna be focused on people. I mean, people are a fascinating design problem in and of themselves. They're messy, they're emotional, they're irrational, they're moody. Uh, they completely ruin every system, and it's fantastic, I love that. And I think that's why I enjoy being in a leadership role, I enjoy working with those people. And because I was so focused on the people themselves that I changed what work was for me to really address those people, it became clear to me that my job was really about preparing the designers under my care for their next job. And I didn't mean, okay, I'm gonna get this person a job at Pinterest next, or I'm gonna get them a job with Etsy. It was more about like, how do I take their craft and accelerate it, enhance it, make it better, so that when they move on to their next job, they have all the skills they need. I've been saying this to my team for a while, and the first time I said it to someone, they were just shocked. They thought I was asking them to like move along, and I was like, no, no, that's not the case at all. I wanna make sure that if you take on a team lead role or a head of role, that you have the hard skills, and also those soft skills that Preet mentioned today. So that was really a big part of realizing that my work was changing and that what I was doing was changing. But being a head of design, I found there were other challenges as well, and this was one of my biggest challenges, just letting go. Realizing that as I had moved from a practitioner into this head of design role, that my job wasn't about maintaining the day-to-day -day work. It wasn't right for me to dive really deep to the granular level and figure out, okay, that should be a tick box versus a radio button. It wasn't about that. Instead, it was about working with my team to understand those things. And yes, there was a big part about maintaining the quality of the work, ensuring that we were actually solving the problems. But it was about not pointing out those problems the moment the work was in front of me, but instead challenging the team, asking them the questions, trying to get them to understand what I was seeing without outright saying it so that they could solve the problems themselves. This is something that I took very much to heart and I believe was the best way forward. It's also not something that I've gotten right. I have been told that I'm really, really harsh with my feedback and I'm just like, oh, I'm sorry, that's probably the British in me. It's probably the fact that it, like, I've worked in environments where it's been really difficult, but I'm getting better at that and I'm constantly learning. And I think as a leader, that's a really important thing to acknowledge that we're, we're winging it, all of us are winging it. And some of us are doing a much better job than others, uh, but it's always a work in progress. This tweet really resonated with me recently. I haven't transcribed it, I'm providing it verbatim here, but it's about the fact that if you're an incredible practitioner, this is how I interpret it, when you're an exceptional practitioner, you know how to do things. You can look at a layout or a design problem or a flow and you know how to optimize and fix it. But you can't just do that yourself because you're robbing those people on your team of an incredible opportunity. There is a learning moment there for them. It's about asking them and helping them. And also, that way you don't drive yourself crazy. That way, you can scale. Okay, so that's a little bit of what I learned about being a head of design. I only have 20 minutes. I have tons of stories, but let's keep going. So that really leads us to this. And I think these are just some of the job titles that I've seen recently. And based on this, I think it's clear that there has never been a better time to be a designer. 
our work is being recognized. We get a seat at the table. Companies know that design is a competitive advantage, that in order to succeed and continue, they need designers. They need people like us. They need the people in this room. And so transitioning again in away from a head of design role, removing myself even further from the craft into a chief of design role has been interesting. And I've only been doing this for a year. Well, actually, to be precise, um, one year and four days. And it's been the most difficult and challenging year of my career so far. Part of it is, if you remember this flow chart, uh, this org chart, pardon me, from before, in theory, the chief of design sits at the top. But CDS, this digital service that the federal government has decided it's going to run, we've been operating like a startup. So over the past year, I have worked at every single one of these levels. I have done actual granular layouts, and then I've been like working on visuals and then moving into like strategy. I've also, you know, the other day I had to roll up my sleeves and actually do a PowerPoint deck for a presentation, because I mean like 20 years in, that's it, never ends. <laughs> but that's exhausting, and I think all of the design leaders here who are from startups, you understand how difficult that is and that it doesn't scale. But now that I'm a year in, a year and four days, I finally have the situational awareness, the context to understand what I really think my job is about. And it's this. Instead of looking internally, trying to make sure that team runs smoothly, instead of acting like that head of design, it's about removing myself somewhat even more, despite the fact that that can be really awkward because you don't feel like you're doing the work anymore. And it's looking across the organization and in my case, that's the government. It's about finding those pockets of people who are doing work, and again, to borrow from Jared, trying to get them from being very unconsciously incompetent or unconsciously unco competent all the way to mastery. It's about the playbook, about trying to find those incredible people who are in the various different government departments, a massive, massive undertaking, unify them, bring them together, and start talking about things. Because at this point, my work is about designing an environment that is design-centric. It's about designing an environment where design thrives, not just at a granular level, but across a giant organization. And it's a massive undertaking. I have not solved this. I don't expect I'm going to solve this in the next year. I expect I'm going to be able to make a tiny dent into what I see as being a huge, huge endeavor. I should probably just get Dana Chisnell and Jared to sign up for a tour of duty with us, but that's beside the point. Working with external partners and trying to make this happen has been the biggest challenge, but I really believe this is what my role is now. Even though it means that sometimes, as chief of design, spoiler alert, as chief of design, like, I still have challenges because I'm removed from the day-to-day -day work. Regardless of the fact that I may have done an incredible amount of work around securing a partnership, specking out the technical architecture, understanding how we're going to integrate with legacy systems, designing user flows, synthesizing research, creating all of these design artifacts and actually doing some of that work, it becomes the role of the team. They iterate, they execute, they learn, they test, they move, they move, they move. And when they succeed, let me just tell you, no one comes up to me and says, hey, Chris, great job on removing those obstacles. Uh, yeah, that team's really done it because of you. I know that. But no one says that, because the team's success is the important thing. They deserve the cake, or whatever celebration you have. The team's success is your success. This is something I've really taken to heart. It's not acknowledging that my work is never going to be done. I may have set a team up for success, but by the time they're actually going live and shipping, I'm already working to set up another team. I'm already working to try and make the conditions better for someone else. And that's the thing I want to remind all of us here today even the people who are thinking about becoming design leaders. It's just that the real work of design, the craft, is one thing, but as you move through leadership, as you grow in seniority, the work becomes about designing environments, workflows, operation models for your team, and that's hard work, and that is the work of design as well. It took me a little while to realize that, and I realized it thankfully before I came to my chief design role, but I thought it's worth mentioning here again today. And I want to leave you for a moment talking about President Truman, because Truman was one of those contentious figures. People loved him, people hated him. His legacy only really started to be repaired and you know, polished quite, quite late after he left 
pardon me, after he left office. For those of you who don't know, Truman was critical in the war effort at the end of the Second World War. But he said this, which is that it is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. And in government and large organizations and even Fortune 500 companies, I have lived by these words. You're so busy trying to make a difference, doing the work for the right reasons, setting up the teams. By the time they're succeeding, you're already somewhere else, but that's okay. Because the reality is there is so much work to be done in the public sector space. There's so much work to be done in large organizations and even startups that you will always be moving on. But if we remember this, it gives me a lot of confidence about not only the future of design and its place in the competitive workplace, but it gives me a lot of hope for the leaders who are here in this room to think that maybe, just maybe, we're gonna make the world a better place. That's a lofty goal, but I really hope that this sort of approach, realizing that we're doing it for the right reasons, is the way forward. So, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. I would love to talk to you about this afterwards. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two questions. Do we have questions in the audience? Back there, Stephanie. Oh, yes, uh, so this is something that I'm still very much working on. It's that idea that when a team brings you work and you're evaluating in a design studio or a design critique way, that it's not your role to just hone in on the problems and say, this is broken, you're gonna fix it with the following solutions. Instead, it's around asking your team to look at that, to think about solutions, to think about problems. Uh, a lovely example I can think of is there's usually a tendency I'm very much about concrete examples, bear with me. There's usually a tendency to group choices into a pull-down menu, you know, one of those menus where you click it and it opens and there's six choices below. And I think country selectors are a great and terrible example of that. There are these massive, giant pull-down menus with so many different things. And very often, if you've only got three or four elements, you don't need a pull-down menu. You can present those four elements, you can use progressive disclosure, you can have them be, you know, different sorts of UI elements. The thing is, what we learned from our research in the United Kingdom government was that pull-down menus have a really high error rate to them. People with mobility efforts, people who aren't comfortable using a mouse, people often will select one option, thinking that they've chosen the right option, but then as they move their mouse, they select a different option. And we learned that for our users, whenever we could avoid a pull-down menu, we would. If we could provide them with a type ahead solution, that was a better thing. If we could do radio buttons, that was better. Or even if it was just about like different UI elements. So that's what I really meant. It's not about leaping in and doing the work yourself. It's about allowing your team to understand what needs to be done. One question at the back. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, you, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's a fantastic question, and I'm going to answer partly with this story. Um, part of my role now is significant amounts of outreach, and I'm on the road a lot, probably every four and a half weeks sometimes. It's calmed down recently, but one of the things I realized, and I'd said this, that as a head of design, I was re really critically important to be close to my team. As a chief of design, I'm not close enough to my team. I'm always traveling, and there was actually a retrospective that happened. And the outcome from the retrospective, and this was before we had a head of design, was that the team wanted more time with me. They needed more of my time. They wanted me to look over things. They wanted me to approve things. They wanted to like, help them work through the problems. And that idea of doing constant, blameless retrospectives, always checking in, always making sure things are working, that's something that I've really taken to heart. A culture of retrospection, a culture of blameless, uh, there's another word for it that I'm losing, but. That's been a critical thing for me. Constantly evaluating, testing the waters, making sure you have a really close rapport with your head of design or the people directly below you so that you can hear things. Uh, one big challenge I've had this year is with this fancy title of chief of design. I feel like I'm a pretty casual guy. I swear a lot. I you know, am chill at the office. 
What I didn't realize is that for a young designer who's just starting their career, I can be a terrifying and imposing figure. This is not something that I was aware of at all, but if you're, this is your first job or maybe even your second job, it can be really off-putting when the chief of design drops by your desk and says, hey, what are you working on? That looks awesome. Have you thought about the following things? Cool, I gotta run to a meeting. They feel like I've just shown up, dropped a grenade, and left. And it really, it, like, it had to be a point where someone took me aside. Uh, Jared talked about like a very kind friend coming and saying, look, just stop. For me, it was a really kind colleague coming up to me and saying, you know you terrify them, right? And I was like, what? No, I'm great, I'm accessible, I'm easy. Genuinely, I am accessible, please come talk to me afterwards, otherwise I'll feel like I've all scared you. But for me, that was a moment of knowing that like, oh, okay, you know what, I've gotta moderate my approach. I still have to learn what it's like. This new role, while I think it's just an evolution and it's next step, people look at it from the outside and they're like, oh right, it's serious time. He just came and told me I'm not doing a good job. And I'm like, no, no, you're doing a great job. You are here because you're qualified. It's just, I want you to think about these things. And I actually have to get a lot better at packaging those sort of like drive-by criticisms. <laughs> Do we have time for one more? Sure. I think I was very quick one. today. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, someone wants to question? call me out on bad leadership. There we go, thank you. <laughs> Yes, I absolutely do. Um, like I said, the past year has been just tumultuous and crazy startup. So when I said I've rolled up my sleeves and actually designed things I have, I typically try and stay away from software because it's just, you know, there are people who are so much more brilliant at Sketch than I am. I'm like, okay, you know what? My tool is really a whiteboard. Get around this whiteboard and I'm gonna iterate six designs with us right now because Right now, I'm the only designer on this project, and like I said, that's not a scalable solution, but I do still occasionally get to do that. Um, one of the interesting challenges I had recently, which fell to me because no one else could do it, was we needed a recruitment booth. And I was like, well, let me dig deep into those old skills. And I was like, okay, how are we gonna fabricate a wall, and how are we gonna do this? And I whiteboarded with a very junior designer who had just come on board and was like, I think, two or three weeks in. I was like, we're gonna do this and this and this, we'll go and buy a photographic background stand, then we'll buy some like jute from home hardware and we'll drape the things and wrap it up and it'll feel like a 1970s Canadian rest stop in a national park. And they were like, whoa. And I was like, oh, I did that thing where I worked really quickly, too fast and didn't involve the process. So I still get to do technical things once in a while and I'm still learning to make sure I bring people on that journey with me at a pace that they feel comfortable with. Okay, Thank I think I've so taken much, up Chris. a lot of time. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone.